afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to congratulate the UVM men's basketball team on winning the conference championship and making the NCAA tournament. Vermonters will be watching this Thursday as you take on Arkansas, and uh, I know you'll make us proud, so good luck. We're going to wrap up today at 1 o'clock, so I'll only offer a few short remarks before turning it over to Dr. Levine. First, I just got off the phone with other governors and White House officials, and here's what we heard. Dr. Walensky reported that hospitalizations continue to go down nationally, just like here in Vermont, while well, we're down today uh, at 12 which includes both those admitted because of COVID and those who found out they have it after being admitted for other reasons. They've been in contact with their counterparts in Europe uh, where some places are seeing an uptick, which is not uh, unexpected. We will see numbers go up and down for quite some time. Dr. Fauci discussed the BA2 variant, which seems to be a bit more transmissible but he also said it does not appear to be any more severe and it does not have any more immune evasion than the original Omicron strain. Again, he said we might see a, an uptick uh, as a country uh, for a, uh, in a few weeks. We're usually lagging behind the UK a bit, uh, which will be manageable. He said that uh, there has been more cases in Europe uh, but ICU numbers are flat, which is encouraging. Jeff Zients said they are cutting distribution of monoclonals to states by 30% beginning next week because Congress did not authorize additional funding. Fortunately, here in Vermont, we have a good supply right now, so we should be set at least in the meantime. Next. I know it's hard to believe, but this past week marked the two-year anniversary of the pandemic in Vermont. It was March 13th, 2020, when I declared a state of emergency, shut down schools, closed businesses, and told people to stay home, to stay safe. Since that day, we've watched as Vermonters have stepped up, gone above and beyond, and as a result, we've led the way throughout these past two years. That willingness to do the right thing has positioned us well as we move into a new phase of our response to this virus, learning how to live with and manage COVID because we know it will not fully go away. But even as Vermont continues to lead the nation, it's still important to pause and reflect on the toll it's taken. Saturday, March 19th, will mark the two-year anniversary of our first confirmed COVID death in Vermont. I'll be ordering the U.S. and Vermont flags to half staff to honor the memories of those we've lost. Even though we're transitioning to a new phase as a country and COVID isn't having the same effect on our daily lives as it once did, we can't forget what we've gone through. And because of the tools we now have and the knowledge we've gained, we won't need to relive the experience of the past 24 months. We can continue our transition to endemic and continue making progress as we've seen in the, over the last few weeks. With that, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thanks, Governor. And in my brief comments today, I'm going to uh, continue on that theme of the progress that we're going to be making. Because it has been about two years since the pandemic became a reality for most of us in Vermont. During that time, we lived with a variety of emotions, anxiety, isolation, some illness, and for some, loss, and many, many other hardships. Some communities have undoubtedly been impacted more than others. We cannot forget these experiences and we need to use the lessons learned as we move forward with our recovery as a state. We've also made huge strides in public health with the development of highly effective vaccines, easy access to testing, and new treatments that are saving lives. 
Even though the virus has not gone away, these advancements are important to keeping us all safe and healthier, which is why we're finding a balance between vigilance around the virus and living with fewer disruptions to our lives due to COVID, both while trying to get back to overall better physical and mental health. I'll briefly summarize the updates made yesterday to public health guidance now that we face lower risks of COVID-19. <clears throat> I want to emphasize that the virus is still here and frankly will be with us to some extent for some time to come. So following these recommendations is still critical to protecting yourself and others. If you test positive, you will need to isolate for five days. If you're a close contact, you do not need to quarantine, but you should get tested if you're not vaccinated or not up to date on your vaccines. Any close contact should get tested if they develop symptoms, of course, regardless of vaccination status. Consider your own circumstances and risk in deciding if you want to take additional precautions, including about wearing a mask around others while indoors. It's also important for you to know if you are at higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19 to help inform the decisions you make about risk. And continue to respect the decisions and needs of others around you about wearing a mask as we move through this time of transition. From the youngest to the oldest, each of us have differing reasons for the choices we make. So again, please be accepting. I also want to acknowledge how important it is to not let our guard down with this virus. We will continue our public health monitoring and surveillance efforts here in Vermont and remain aware of national and international developments regarding new strains, vaccine guidance, and treatments. In the meantime, keep your masks around and hold on to your rapid tests. Know that if the situation changes, we will be prepared to change with it. Now, I've also spoken about changes coming to our approach to testing. As demand for testing goes down, and PCR results are often not quick enough with a highly transmissible variant. Rapid take-home tests, on the other hand, help you take action quickly if you test positive. Isolating, telling close contacts, and accessing treatment if you're at high risk. We will now begin offering appointments for these types of tests at many of our health department test sites. Starting tomorrow, when you make your appointment, you will have the option to pick up a rapid take-home test of the antigen type or a lamp test. The lamp test is similar to PCR, but can be done at home. PCR will still be offered for those who need it for now. For example, for a child under two, or if you need a result letter for travel. Look for information on our website starting tomorrow. We will also update our testing recommendations for Vermonters. When there is less virus in our communities, there is less of a chance that you might be infected and don't know it. This means we don't need to test as often, such as around social gatherings. Testing is still available to all, but we only recommend testing in specific situations when the risk is highest. If you have symptoms of COVID-19 or you are a true close contact and are not vaccinated or up to date on your vaccines. As always, we'll continue to urge Vermonters to get vaccinated and stay up to date on their vaccines. We know from almost a year's worth of experience with vaccinations in Vermont and from data coming in from around the world about Delta, Omicron, and the BA2 subvariant, that vaccination is still the most powerful tool we have to protect against the most serious outcomes of COVID-19. I'll turn it back there. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions.
timeline of opening it up without any restrictions? Um, there was no conversation on the White House uh, call about that subject. Um, but I have heard that uh, the restrictions may be lifted uh, soon, but uh, but nothing confirmed at this point. Where, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be in the U.S. I mean, this is the Canadians that have to decide this. As we're kind of turning the corner here, you know, I, I mean, it feels like we we've been here before when we hit 80 percent last summer, and you know, we, we lifted masks, and I think there's. I, what should Vermonters' expectations be, I guess, going forward, uh, you know, in terms of how to deal with the virus, how to live with it, just having that, that uh, mental preparedness? What, what should people's expectations be? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we should be afraid of the virus. We've learned so much over the last two years. We have a lot of tools in the toolbox. Uh, Dr. Levine mentioned the most powerful tool is being fully vaccinated and we should continue to strive to do that i mean there's still opportunities if you haven't been vaccinated yet uh, you still should uh, because we don't know what strain what variant is coming in the future we just know that there are going to be new variants and new strains uh, again what we've seen with the omicron is that it's less severe and the ba2 uh, variant of the omicron uh, is less severe as well so that's all good news, uh, and uh, and having the uh, being fully vaccinated uh, has uh, proven uh, to reduce uh, the severity uh, from from the impacts of uh, of COVID. So, so again, we have a lot of tools. Uh, we should just uh, manage this uh, just like we would anything else. We've seen this with the flu as well uh, over the years uh, that we have upticks of flu, uh, but we have. Uh, vaccination periods as well. So I think this is what we should expect in the years to come. It'll be treated much like the flu. Dr. Levine, maybe have Dr. Levine add that. I guess the main punchline would be there are no certainties. Um, however, one can look at science and look at data and make some modest predictions. And right now, the modest prediction is that this is the right time to make the changes that we're making. Um, this is a time the population, in a sense, deserves to be able to try to move forward because we perceive it is safe enough for everyone to do that. Um, just like you referred to, there was a time we saw last summer that things didn't work out for as long a time as anyone would have hoped for. Um, no matter who you ask in the world, no matter what authority, you're not going to find someone who can predict the next variant to the moment and uh, promise you that you'll have months and months of this kind of more relaxed stance that we're taking now. Uh, and just looking around the world, by the way, um, you know, we look at China, we look at Hong Kong. Um, those are countries that are having significant increases. They kind of started with a zero COVID kind of policy, which with the more transmissible variants just doesn't really stand a chance, unfortunately, against the virus. And they have very particular situations where uh, they have an inferior vaccine. They have a um, <clears throat> population that, at least in Hong Kong, is more distrustful of the government, so hasn't embraced the vaccine with the amount of vigor that people would have hoped. Then we have countries, uh, as the governor is referring to, like in Europe, that are seemingly having some element of prolongation of this Omicron phase with the BA2 variant. I, I can tell you that we have found the BA2 variant in Vermont and in the United States. It doesn't seem to be as large a proportion of cases as the original Omicron BA1 uh, variant uh, has proven to be. Most of what we think about that is instead of producing an additional surge, it's just going to drag things on a little. So the tail of that epidemic curve is going to be prolonged because BA2 will keep it alive as opposed to it will cause a huge new issue with it. So that's kind of what we've encountered. Governor, uh, a little different topic. How exciting is it for you uh, to uh, meet and greet the crew of uh, USS Vermont tomorrow. And how important is it for Vermont itself? Yeah, I mean, that's our namesake. 
uh, and uh, looking forward to meeting some of the crew members. And it's, uh, again, a, a, a sense of pride uh, for Vermont to have uh, USS Vermont and the crew here. And I know they take a lot of pride in that as well. So really very much looking forward to it. State House topics, if I could. Um, the uh, House, it looks like they'll be considering legislation that would ban certain school mascots that are deemed um, discriminatory. Would you support such a measure? I have to see what it looks like, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I know that there were involved there. Secretary of Education is involved in, in, uh, in the discussion. So we'll just have to see what the, the final version looks like. House, I believe, is also moving along with the um, clean heat standard, um, switching over to fuel fuel credits and the, a marketplace for fuel dealers. Is, is that going to be enough? How, how, what is your thinking on that? Well, let's put aside the policy uh, for a minute. And uh, from what I understand, uh, the direction they're going is to have the PUC make a lot of those decisions uh, and uh, to abdicate their their authority, I guess, and give it to the PUC to make those decisions. Um, so once again, as you might uh, imagine, I'm opposed uh, to having the PUC be the final destination of that decision making. I think it should come back, regardless of what, how you feel about the clean uh, heat standard. Uh, whatever the PUC does, it needs to come back from there through the legislative process for a final sign-off. Um, again, they can abdicate their authority, but I get a vote too, and the executive branch needs to be involved. So we have to make sure uh, that a regulatory body like the PUC, who isn't really elected and isn't really beholding uh, to anyone, um, does what we want them to do. And if they take a position that's going to be uh, counter uh, to the affordability of Vermont and, and some of what we're seeing uh, at that point, uh, then we, again, we owe it to Vermonters uh, to, to either vote that up or down. It's been a few weeks since lifting the masks in schools. Um, a lot of talk about the social concern when the masks were on and not being able to read emotions. Have you heard, you know, of reprieve over the past few weeks? Are we getting the results, you know, anticipated from lifting the masks? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm just hearing anecdotally like everyone else and from um, some of our staff uh, members uh, with kids. Uh, and generally, I think uh, it's been well received, and I think kids are are getting uh, acclimated uh, to seeing their friends again after two years of not seeing their faces. Uh, so um, I, I think it's been good for for kids at this point. And, and again, uh, it's not as though uh, we we know there's going to be cases in the future, but I think uh, for the uh, emotional. Um, stability of kids and uh, and the uplifting of uh, of seeing their their friends again and their reactions and their emotions. Uh, I think it's all good. Anything you want to add to that? All right, we'll move on to the phone. Starting with Wilson Ring, AP. Um, hi, everybody. I hope you. I've got a bit of a scratchy connection today. I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, just one question, Governor. Um, in one of the coronavirus relief funds, Vermont got uh, a lot of money for uh, federal emergency rental assistance. And now it's my understanding Vermont is having to give back, uh, I think it's a 30, in their neighborhood of $30 million uh, because it wasn't used so that money can be given to other states. What do you make of that? Yeah, there was fairly strict parameters around the use of the money, which made it problematic. Um, so I, um, I can get you a better answer uh, from the experts, um, but, uh, but basically, from my understanding, uh, that, was, uh, that was the problem, just the, the very strict uh, parameters, and, and uh, we weren't able to utilize it uh, as much as we had hoped. Uh, do you think that has left people uh, who could have used it um, in, in dire straits? Well, we use a lot of money. I mean, in some respects, 
Um, we, uh, in that category, uh, we received uh, the small state minimum, which uh, gave us an incredible amount of money. So uh, that may be, you know, part of the reasoning uh, for the, uh, the, the lack of use of, of the full amount of money. But again, it's the uh, strict parameters around the money uh, usage that was, uh, we could have used it if we could have had more flexibility. Okay, thank you very much. I'll have somebody reach out to you about that. Yeah, uh, Wilson, I'll have okay. Commissioner Hanford give you a call. Okay, thanks. Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Uh, good morning, Governor. I think you're off the hook. I think this question is for uh, Dr. Levine. Uh, just wanted to touch base on the, the lamp tests that you mentioned. Um, if, if someone were to pick up a lamp test and, and do it at home, are, are they getting everything to be able to process that at home, or do they then need to bring that lamp test somewhere to get processed, and what's the timeline on something like that? No, I believe it's a test kit that they would be getting, so they would be able to take the test home and get a result. Okay, appreciate it. That, that's all for me. Thank you. Greg, I've actually uh, I've taken one of the LAMP tests myself, and it's uh, interesting uh, to utilize and, and very easy, uh, but it does give you those instantaneous results uh, that, uh, that are very accurate. So... I have two, Governor, and, and I can I can say you're right. Yeah. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Hello. I'm curious if Vermont is continuing to monitor the wastewater um, in its municipalities that have wastewater treatment systems. I was looking on the CBC website, and the wastewater plant in Franklin County has seen a significant increase in COVID in its system over the last 15 days, from February 24th to March 10th. And in Burlington, its east plant was showing a similar increase over a similar time period. Will you continue to monitor that? And have you are, are these trends alarming at all as the BA1 and BA2 variants are spreading? Yeah. Uh, first, um, first question, I guess, is will we be uh, utilizing this in the future? And absolutely. Uh, we've, prov uh, we've proved that it's been very effective. In fact, we're expanding it. I think the federal government has an interest in expanding it as well uh, because we can monitor what's happening uh, throughout the state. Um, second to that, um, again, what we've been doing, uh, and we've, we've said this all along, is you know, the case numbers, of course, um, are an indicator, but that's not what we're watching. That's not the metric we watch. The metric we watch is the hospitalizations, um, but, and particularly uh, the hospitalizations for those who have COVID and are, are going uh, are admitted because of COVID, not because they just happen to have COVID as they're admitted for something else. So again, we'll continue to watch the hospitalizations. The ICU uh, numbers, again, are, are coming down significantly. And uh, on the White House call today, they talked a lot about that, and and uh, they said that uh, they're seeing this across the country, uh, which uh, bodes well uh, for for all of us, um, and it and it shows that the severity, uh, two things: the severity of the variant uh, at this point in time, time, whether it's BA1 or BA2, is less significant uh, than other strains, um, but also uh, that. Uh, vaccines are having uh, a positive effect on that, and uh, and and the uh, the results are less severe conditions. Dr. Levine. So right now, I believe we have seven sites in Vermont that will be doing the wastewater surveillance. Not all of them up and running just yet, and there's been an infusion of CDC uh, grant money, if you will, to to get this going. We're under the understanding that there actually can be more communities, um, and so um, we're, we're, we've been made aware of that, and we'll be working with other communities around the state to see if they are interested. Keep in mind, um, as opposed to the daily case count, where it's you know X number of cases per day or X number of people in the hospital per day, this is viral copies per liter of wastewater and it's a very different measurement system 
And there's not a lot of standardization around that for people to understand exactly what level means what. But if you think about it, there are many things that are in our environment, some of which we measure, some of which we don't, but there's always a baseline level. And I suspect we're gonna see that happen with this virus. Uh, and then we're going to need to just watch, as you pointed out, trends and see if the trends are going in one way or the other and if they have some new meaning to them. Um, even the trends in the Burlington water where uh, there was an increase and there was more BA2, uh, we have not been seeing any impact of that in terms of case rates around the state soaring, uh, even in Chittenden County, or hospitalization rates uh, at all being impacted. If anything, they're going the opposite direction. And we haven't had a death in Vermont, uh, one death in the last week which is very gratifying and reassuring news at this point in time. So we're all kind of learning uh, how to use this measurement uh, together as a state and as a nation. And we'll um, keep you apprised because there are really, I think, some tricks to understanding the data and concerns about really just watching the trends and not allowing um, the population to get too excited at certain times because a certain number of viral copies per liter doesn't have the same impact as it may on what happens in the hospitals and in deaths in Vermont. Thank you for that detailed um, explanation. A quick follow-up about vaccines for you, Dr. Levine. I received um, emails from people who had a J&J &J shot and then a Moderna, and they are concerned that they are not properly or fully protected. And I think I've asked this question before for someone who had two J&J &J shots and not an mRNA vaccine. Um, do people who had J&J &J and a Moderna need a third shot? Yeah, there's, there's not a clear guidance for that at this point in time that I can tell you that I'm aware of people who have gotten a third shot in that setting, but the reality is uh, they've gotten that extra shot. If they're not immunocompromised, they, in theory, can stop there until any further guidance comes out. And if they wanted a third shot, could they get one? Well, we're finding that they have gotten one, is all I can tell you, whether it, were, whether it was from a healthcare provider or elsewhere. And, it's, and, and it, can be the inter, it can be the interpretation of their risk level, too, um, in terms of their immune system. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Lisa, I'm in that category of uh, receiving a J&J &J first and then a Moderna as a second, the booster, uh, and I have not had the third shot at this point in time, but, um, but I'll be waiting for guidance and when it's time to do so, I'll I'll have a third shot if and okay. when that happens. But who will provide that? I'm the, the CDC. CDC. I, I'm I'm waiting for the CDC to provide that information to me. Got it. Thank you very much. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Governor H six oh six now being voted on in the House as we speak, it would require that 50% of total land area in Vermont be conserved, protected, or otherwise never be developed. Have you seen this bill? And what do you think of it, especially regarding Vermont housing needs? Um, I, I have not seen H606. Um, but I'll put that on my list of reading for tonight um, because it sounds as though it could have an impact on, on housing, but I just don't know what it, what it does. It follows a UN uh, recommendation that by 2050, 50% of all area in the world, oh. but also Vermont doing its so wait, fair so, share. So you're talking about uh, the U.S. House? No. No, I'm talking about the Vermont House. This is a bill that Amy Sheldon sponsored and was voted out of House Natural Resources. Okay. Uh, it requires that 50% of Vermont land 
would be reserved, protected, or just not developed. I have not seen that yet, but uh, but I'll definitely look into it. Thank you. Um, also, I understand, and I apologize that this question has already been asked, but that Pfizer is now recommending a fourth dose uh, for COVID-19. And what is your position on that? And what, if anything, would be the state's involvement in facilitating a, a fourth shot? Um, you know, I saw the same thing uh, from Pfizer, um, and I haven't seen or heard uh, from the CDC or FDA uh, in terms of whether that's advised or not. Uh, I think the reality is that there's going to be a series of, of boosters, so to speak, uh, in the future, much like the flu, uh, trying to chase that variant uh, that uh, is, uh, is uh, becoming prevalent at that point in time. So I don't think we should be shocked uh, that there's going to be another uh, another vaccination uh, vaccine uh, available whether it's the third or fourth dose or just a yearly dose I just don't know uh, but um, but again I'm sure the CDC and FDA are looking at that at this point in time Dr. Levine do you expect those, those boosters will carry the same sort of uh, mandates either employer or workplace or state government mandates that you see in the that? Uh, this is Dr. Levine. Let me go back to the first part of the question. Uh, it shouldn't shock us that the manufacturers are collecting data uh, over time about the performance of their vaccine and the uh, mounting of further antibody response in people who get further doses. Uh, but they don't set the national policy about how this plays out. So until the advisory panel to the FDA and the advisory panel to the CDC who deal with vaccine policy uh, weigh in. Right now, the word we're getting from most of them is, sure, boosters will probably be necessary at some time in the future, but this may not be the time. And so this could be you know, a year after the time you got your previous booster. Um, no one is indicating that we need to have something sooner. And again, without the pressure, if you will, of a variant strain, that uh, would require a major change in vaccine policy, we're not gonna see that happen right now. And the vaccines, as we've said here many times against Omicron, have been phenomenal with regard to protection against the most serious outcomes. And that is indeed the goal. So uh, there has been no need, as we've navigated the Omicron portion of the pandemic, to add yet another booster into the mix so but if it becomes necessary will there be the same level of of, of mandated vaccine you know, for your job as we've seen i think it's in pre school? premature uh, to determine that at this point in time if if we believe uh, that um, that covid is going to become the next flu so to speak endemically uh, then I would assume we'd treat it the same. Now, there are some organizations, uh, some hospitals and so forth, uh, healthcare facilities that require uh, that uh, their employees have a flu shot. Uh, and I think that's, that's within uh, their ability to do so. Uh, but, um, but a widespread mandate uh, is not something that I would foresee unless something unforeseen happens. So we'll just have to cross that bridge when it comes, but we're nowhere near making that decision at this point. Thank you. Greg Sikanik, Bennings and Banner. Thank you, and good afternoon, Governor. Uh, this might be a question for you or for uh, Dr. Levine or for Secretary French. Uh, but given that we are making masks optional in schools and given that we know the COVID-19 vaccines have been proven safe and effective, how and when will a decision be made on whether there will be a COVID vaccination requirement for the 2022-23 school year? Dr. Levine. <clears throat> so at this point in time, we've been really heartened by the uptake of the uh, age 5 to 11 vaccine. It didn't all happen at once. It's been happening gradually over time, but uh, we're 
I believe, last time I looked, still leading the nation in the uptake there. Um, and that's the way things have worked in Vermont pretty much throughout our vaccine campaign. The issue is, um, should a school system mandate that? Um, we have an immunization advisory council that did just meet about a month ago. Most of that was more of an operational and organizational meeting. Uh, and there are several members of that council that um, were not there because they need to have replacements appointed. So that will meet again in the future. And I'm sure this will be an issue that it talks about. And then they will provide uh, advice as per their title to myself as Commissioner of Health and to the Department of Health. And, and then in turn, we will provide that advice uh, to the rest of state government. So right now, there's um, no contemplation of uh, doing that. And I'm not aware around the country if that's um, been a very active issue either in other um, school districts. Thank you. That's my question. Aaron Patanko, VT Digger. Hello. Um, I have a question. I, I noticed, uh, Scott, that you mentioned that the um, monoclonal antibodies are getting reduced because of lack of funding. Uh, I've also heard that the federal government is pulling funding for uninsured people cover their testing, treatment, and vaccination, I believe. Um, how will this affect uninsured Vermonters? Is there any kind of, I don't know, state intervention that would make a difference here, or are uninsured Vermonters really going to lose that um, assistance? Um, Patenko, I think I'm going to refer that to either Dr. Levine or maybe uh, Mr. Pichek, you want to try that, Dr. Levine? I, I can start. <clears throat> the, my only comment is I, I have not heard what you've heard. So, um, yeah, I, I, I have heard because of the governor's call today what you heard about the monoclonal, um, which, by the way, won't impact any Vermonter. We have uh, adequate supply of that at this point in time. Uh, but I've not heard about the, the second point you made. Uh, Commissioner Pichek, have you heard anything to that degree either? Uh, no, Dr. Yeah, no doctor would be not on the uninsured population. On the insured population, our bulletin, our regulation that requires coverage and uh, no out-of-pocket will remain in place for some time still, but uh, I haven't heard of that on the uninsured side. Um, this is this is just per NPR. They tweeted um, recently. The White House this morning will have to wind down a program to test, treat, and vaccinate uninsured people for COVID because the administration has been run out of money for the program, which Congress failed to include in funding legislation. So it, it, see, it did seem connected with the um, the monoclonal, you know, issue that you mentioned as well. I, th I think um, I think Aaron on the call this morning with the White House. Uh, almost every issue that came up, uh, the, the thread throughout was that Congress didn't appropriate enough money for us to continue. Um, so I, they, they definitely are, um, are advocating uh, for the funding uh, to be uh, re-implemented uh, by Congress. Uh, so I think that that's, we're going to continue to hear. I don't think it's run out yet. Uh, but um, but they want to make sure that they uh, they catch this wave so to speak, and uh, and make sure that it's put back into place. But uh, but I noticed that with almost every single question, uh, was ended with uh, Congress didn't fund the appropriate amount of money to continue. Okay. Uh, well, I guess we'll have to see. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hey, good afternoon, Governor. There was a lot of workforce issues this week. Uh, the jobs numbers were, as you know, revised and released on Monday. Today is Equal Pay Day. Uh, Vermont, although it has the um, lead the, the nation in, in um, the differential, where uh, women are still paid on average $4,600 less than men. And uh, also yesterday, Vail announced 
that it's increasing its minimum wage to $20 an hour, and, and they're a significant employer here in Vermont at uh, Mount Snow and Okemo and, of course, uh, Stone Mountain. Um, you've talked about strategic um, ways to increase the labor force and other things. Would it be strategic to increase the minimum wage um, generally in Vermont instead of letting market forces play out over time to, as a way to bring people into the state, make us a, a, a leader not only um, um, in the minimum wage, but also by, by doing that, it would also help women generally? Yeah, no, I, I still believe uh, that uh, supply and demand uh, is the best policy in terms of, of wage growth. I mean, we've seen it over the last year or two. Uh, we have a lack of, uh, of workers. We have uh, uh, an overabundance of jobs, and that has resulted in higher wages. And I still believe that's the right approach. Um, I. I, I, my hat's off to, uh, I think, Vail sees the writing, handwriting on the wall. They need more employees, so they're raising their, uh, their minimum wage as a result. So that proves to me that it, that it works. Uh, any, any, sometimes you'll see this where uh, one company will, uh, well, that the, the workers themselves will sort of cherry pick on who's paying more, and of course the ski areas are not that far from each other. And, uh, is there any any other strategic way other than letting supply and demand play, um, play out to increase the, the labor force, which is down by 26,000 workers just here in Vermont in the last three years? Well, we could provide more housing, uh, more housing, affordable housing for uh, the missing middle, those uh, that uh, the working, the work uh, workforce, and uh, some of those initiatives we put into place. Uh, as you probably have reported on and written about um, the Budget Adjustment Act that we asked uh, for money, more money for housing immediately um, was not included. Um, so we're going to have to wait until July at this point uh, for those to, to come into play. So if uh, I believe uh, housing is critical uh, to workforce development, that's, I don't think anybody's coming to Vermont because of uh, the minimum wage or lack thereof or whatever. I think, I think it's the quality of life, uh, but they have to, and, and an opportunity, um, but, um, but as well, they need, need housing in order to stay. And uh, we continue to see, and, and I continue to hear uh, from people who either are considering coming or are not considering to stay, uh, and the reasoning behind that uh, is uh, is because of the lack of affordable, decent affordable housing uh, for that middle income, the, for the workforce. All right, great. Thank you, Governor. <coughs> Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Governor Scott, um, uh, in his opening remarks, Dr. Levine mentioned Vermonters should hold on to masks and rapid tests uh, to be prepared for if and, and likely when uh, conditions will shift and, and will need to return to their use. I'm curious, um, at the state level, without getting too deep into the weeds, what capacity and programs and preparations will the state keep in place for pandemic response versus, you know, what... It, what do you envision further unwinding and um, and rolling up now that things are changing? Well, I'm not sure that we have to unwind a whole lot at this point. We didn't have any. Uh, we provided guidelines uh, in a lot of respects uh, with the masking in schools, for instance, uh, but we didn't have any mandates after the state of uh, emergency uh, lapsed, and uh, and so I don't. I mean, we'll, we'll still keep all the tools in the toolbox. We just make sure that they're all sharp, right? Uh, we want to make sure uh, that we uh, have everything available, uh, that we're, um, we're preparing uh, for whatever happens in the future. We've learned a lot over the last two years. And, and uh, again, just keeping all of those uh, tools that we have viable. And things like making sure that we have an inventory of masks and gloves and things that we were in short supply of, 
uh, in the initial stages of, uh, of the pandemic. And, and I guess I, part of what I was looking for was, was um, the dedication of state, specific state resources. Um, you know, the state had a hand in, in uh, uh, building up testing centers, distribution of tests, uh, you know, filling in um, healthcare worker shortages with National Guard troops. You know, is there, uh, are there any programs that, that uh, of that ilk that you envision needing to hold on to or now that it's been done and sort of it's understood how to accomplish it um, you don't really need to keep something in place you can just reconstitute it if and when it's necessary yeah uh, again we are uh, in a, a continuing uh, evolution of improvement so we continue to look at what worked what didn't and you're talking really about systems and you're talking about people um, we were able to utilize uh, people from uh, different areas, from, from different departments and agencies and so forth to come together, what's the National Guard or, or all the people involved. I mean, that was part of our success, and I don't think they get enough credit uh, in some respects, our state employees, um, from the health department uh, to those uh, in, uh, in, in the warehouse um, in distribution of of uh, tests and masks and vaccines and so forth. I mean, that was a day in, day out uh, type of uh, process. And uh, we continually improved on that. So we have those systems, we have the plays uh, in place. Uh, so we'll, we'll pull those out as needed, uh, but we don't wanna continue the program if it's not going to be utilized, but we, we know what works and uh, we're prepared to use that if necessary. Okay, thank you very much. Joseph Gresser, the Barton Chronicle. All right, we'll try Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Better, Joe? Come on. We got you, Ed. Hello. We got it. Yep. There we go. Oh, <laughs> Governor, I haven't talked to you in a while. <laughs> we need to have better internet oh. up here. Um, helps my question helps on the way. Dr. Levine, so you're actually off his hook. Okay. Well, the question may, is, wait, I before a new person who got um, a Moderna vaccine, they got the second vaccine. Can you hear me? We can. We hear you, Ed. Come on. Okay. <laughs> they got the booster shot. And when they got a booster, they had a medical reaction to it. My question to Dr. Levine is, what is will you go if it suggested that they take a fourth shot? Okay, before he answers that, Ed, make sure you write an article about utilizing ARPA funding uh, for broadband expansion, as well as cell service, especially in the kingdom, which is some of the provisions we've asked for uh, and I'm not sure, you know, how the legislature is going to follow through on that. So uh, keep their feet to the fire. Dr. Levine. Hi, Ed. Um, so what I heard was they got the Moderna first dose, they got the Moderna second dose, and they got an additional third dose and had a reaction after that third dose and you're worried about if there's recommendation for a fourth dose what do they do so obviously every case is individual It'd be kind of important to know what happened after the third dose most of the reports are that the third dose is not more likely than the second dose to give anybody any significant kind of adverse effect or side effect <clears throat> um, and the third dose is a lower dose than the first two doses were are you aware of exactly what happened? Oh. <laughs> I'll be calling as 
legislature. Ed, we can hear you ruffling papers, so we know you're still there. Do you, do you know what happened after the third dose? So, barring any new input, what I can tell you is that most of the more recent literature regarding getting another type of vaccine after the first two doses um, showed excellent results with regard to people being able to maintain the kind of immune status that they wanted to. So he could theoretically have a different vaccine substituted. But I, without really knowing any more details, it's going to be hard for me to give you any more advice than that. Obviously, hopefully the individual has discussed this with their own health care provider so they can put it in the context of benefits versus risks. <clears throat> but I think that is done. Colin Flanders, seven days. Hi, thanks. Um, taking a look at the vaccine dashboard, it seems like um, the age group of 18 to 29 year olds still hasn't even reached 50% for booster shots. I'm curious, could you talk a little bit about, um, just a little bit about that, what efforts are uh, underway, if any, to continue to try to encourage that group of people to get shots? And, and do you have any concerns that if that number stays that low, that that's going to cause long-term issues as we move towards this endemic phase? That, uh, that age category has been a source of frustration for us from the very beginning, um, but uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer the rest of it. Interestingly, um, within that age category are college students. And I just got off my college uh, call that I have every week with the Institutes of Higher Education in Vermont this morning. And we have a fair number of colleges that have a 97 plus percent rate of people completely vaccinated, up to date, with booster. Uh, and then a few of the smaller ones come in a little less than that. Uh, so those colleges did mandate it often, though not always, so that um, that's how they achieve that kind of a rate. I think if I can get into the mind of people in that age group, um, probably they're looking themselves at the fact that what's happened with the virus is it's evolved into this less virulent but still very um, transmissible variant of Omicron. And many of them um, have, I guess, interpreted that as, well, I'm probably not at high risk in my age group of getting a serious outcome, because that's true when you look at the data. Um, and if I get the virus, I get the virus. Uh, and that's the attitude that they've taken. Doesn't mean it's the right attitude, but it, it is the one that uh, they're entitled to and that they've taken. We still feel that from an overall standpoint, um, they do want to reduce, they should want to reduce their risk of any serious outcome to the maximal point possible. And we know that immunity wanes significantly after just two doses in the mRNA series and that the booster brings it right back to where it should be. And that goes on for weeks to months after that point in time. So I would still advise them to do that uh, in the overall scheme of things, especially if they want to be prepared for something in the future that we don't even know about yet that could happen where they'd want to have the really best level of immunity uh, possible. So we, you know, we, we have tried to appeal to the audience in many ways uh, in terms of providing access to the vaccine. So indeed, uh, we've gone to college campuses. We've gone to work sites of all sorts. We've held um, community-based clinics um, that uh, are pretty accessible for anybody at the time. We've made uh, pharmacies and other sites walk-in business so that uh, you don't have to take the trouble to schedule an appointment and all of that. Um, and we've done, you know, in more remote parts of the state, uh, the barnstorming tours. So there's a whole bunch of ways we've tried to meet 
this age group where they are, um, but you've seen the results. Um, I would like to think that those results would be worse if we hadn't done all the things I just said. So if we can look at it with the glass half full, maybe that's a, a better approach. Thank you. Lisa, the Waterbury Roundabout. Good afternoon, can you hear me? We can. Hi, uh, let's see, I have two relatively quick questions, I think. The first is about um, schools this week and how the um, mask requirements um, are dropped. And at the same time, it looks like schools are also dropping a lot of the communications that they've been doing around COVID cases um, as far as like spreading the word when there's cases um, to show that information with staff and families. Um, I know the state is trying to dial back on the requirements for schools because they've been so overtaxed and they've had so much to do. Um, but if a school sees um, an increase in cases, if there's a spike, is there anything prohibiting schools from um, communicating that information to their, you know, their school communities, if that could be helpful to people? Um, I know if, if there's nothing really to say, there's nothing to say, but if, if they start seeing increases, is there anything stopping them from sharing some of that information in order to, to help people understand if they've been exposed? I'm wondering if uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher is on. I don't believe there is, Lisa, but um, any provision preventing them from doing that. But maybe um, Deputy Secretary Boucher can answer that further. Yes. Uh, hello, Governor. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. The governor is correct. Uh, there is nothing that's prohibiting um, schools um, or districts from uh, getting those communications out. Um, I think most schools, um, as uh, reflected of an earlier question, um, have really been seeing, um, and again, I would say this anecdotally, have been seeing um, and focused on the fact that um, masks are coming off. Um, kids are appreciative of that. Um, and I think that's where um, most of the attention has been this week, sort of across the board. Um, but there is nothing that prohibits the school from certainly communicating broader trends like that. Okay, good. I was just thinking in terms of if they start seeing cases popping up again and in a way that they, you know, think it would be useful for people to be aware and be cautious, et cetera, um, should they, you know, they could resume some of that if, if there was reason to do that. Yeah, Lisa, I might um, just add that I think in the past, I mean, over the last few decades, if there was an outbreak of anything in a school, whether it was flu or something of that nature, they would communicate that uh, to their to their kids and, and uh, to, to parents. Uh, and I think we have to look at it s somewhat similar to that. I mean, that's what that's what we're moving into. So they still have a, I think, an obligation to let um, let students and, and parents know what's going on. Dr. Levine. And just one quick piggyback to that is um, the test at home program is still in existence. Um, and so obviously uh, schools are still in the uh, position where they can distribute tests as needed to families who would like to take advantage of that uh, still at this time. So um, there's nothing to preclude that from happening. and. Obviously, schools are sometimes the ones who let people know, but I think kids let each other know and parents let each other know as well. So there'll be many ways for people to find out if there were cases. But again, we are seeing markedly less cases in Vermont right now, and the school is a reflection of the community. So I would have presumed that the schools are not seeing as many cases either. And that's, that's a good point too, Governor, as far as it being like a other, any other uh, Ill illnesses that might be out there to tell people about. Um, one other question on a different topic here that's important in Waterbury is, you know, looking at how things are starting to shift back to some, some more normal. Um, I'm wondering how the process is playing out right now with the state workforce um, and state workers returning to um, their offices, of which we have a bunch here in Waterbury. Um, people are eager to see state workers returning here during the daytime. I'm wondering how that's, how that's moving along. 
I might ask, uh, is Secretary Clauser on? Yes, I'm here, Governor. Um, maybe you could give an update on, I, I know that we've uh, uh, encouraged uh, people to come back uh, to the workforce. Uh, some are still working remotely, um, but uh, maybe give us an update on that or if you have anything. Sure. So as the governor said, many workers do have a telework, remote work plan. Those were worked on with their supervisors and um, signed and authorized back in November. The past several months, folks have been utilizing more ad hoc remote work based on um, lots of different factors. And so now that the Omicron surge has gone down, we are encouraging folks to um, come back to the office to their core days, which are days when many folks are in the office and it is part of what it has been negotiated in many remote work plans. That being said, the remote work plans are different based on the programmatic needs. So um, some groups and divisions and departments may have plans that look different than others. But you should start seeing in general remote workers returning to the office at least for core days, which are typically two to three days a week. Okay, great, thank you very much. Okay. Um, Ed, when you're making that call to your legislator, uh, adding to the broadband issue, uh, maybe you could talk to them about housing, but as well, my tax relief package, $50 million tax relief package, the legislature has not taken up that will help 25% of Vermonters. That's important to us. Um, but as well, I wanted to remind everyone that tonight at 6.30 on the State House steps, I'll be joined by statewide office holders, lawmakers, faith leaders, members of the general public, and more for a vigil in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. I'll also be signing a bill dedicating more than $640,000 towards humanitarian efforts in Ukraine, which, uh, which uh, equals uh, $1 uh, per Vermonter. Anyone is invited, and I hope to see some of you there tonight. We'll also have music from a Vermont Youth Orchestra a Quartet on the State House steps and hear from a representative from the organization um, receiving the aid funding. So again, we'll be gathering at 6.30 uh, with remarks after it should be over within an hour. So thank you all very much. We'll see you again next Tuesday.